Okay, well, let me get started. So, a long, long time ago, back in uh, 2001, Paul Fenwick and I started this wonderful business called Pearl Training Australia. And we embarked on the great adventure of running a tiny micro business in Australia. It was great. We got to choose which 60 hours we wanted to work each week and which clients we wanted to hate working for and which unsuitable projects we wanted to take on anyway. Reluctantly, but we got to do it. We were in charge of making the money and doing the accounting and doing the marketing and filling in our, our own BAS forms and trying to work out how to do tax processing things for a small business and handle the months where sometimes we got no invoices paid and then the next month where all of the invoices got paid and so our income sort of went like this. Running a small business was great. And we started up our business as a natural extension of the work that we had done as bespoke programmers and, and general consulting to pay for our way through university. Which meant that I was doing bespoke programming, mostly in PHP, which as you can see is perfect for a business called Pearl Training Australia. And he was doing lots of sysadmin, because that's what he'd been doing. Now, we had both also done tutoring for the Department of Computer Science. They had given us a stack load of money and it was great, we had a good time doing all this wonderful computer science stuff. But, as you can see, a lot of, but we didn't get to make money out of that very quickly. Our training courses were really slow to pick up. So we had this wonderful business called Pearl Training Australia and we were doing sysadmin and PHP programming. As you do. And starting a small specific product specific training business in Australia is a lot harder than we kind of thought it would be. Big businesses want to hire other big businesses and those big businesses that they want to hire provide training credits. And training credits are kind of a lot like what mobile telcos do. They're like, pay $50 and we will give you $500 of value. No, you get $50 of value, you get what you paid for. But they're like, you know, pay this sum and we will give you this many dollars worth of training value. And that's kind of hard to compete with. They're like, you know, we pay $100,000 and give you a million dollars worth of training credits. They want to spend their million dollars of training credits with that provider. They do not want to give it to us. So we had a bit of a challenge to work through there. And in addition to those challenges of getting our name out there and, and fighting the, the lock-in from these large tra training companies and trying to say, hey, we exist. We had to f fight inertia because people were like, oh, well, we always do our training with HP. We always do our training with IBM. It doesn't matter that they don't have pulled courses and that's what we actually need right now. We'll just teach our students how to use, uh, sorry, our class staff members how to use MySQL instead. That's the right way. And so we were persistent with our advertising. We sent lots of things to user groups. We had these newsletters which were useful, cool things that we had learned in Perl recently, sometimes just to write the newsletter, often just to write the newsletter. And eventually we got a great reputation because everyone who used us said, you are the best training provider I have ever had. This was the best training course I've had in my entire career. When you get that kind of feedback consistently, businesses start to listen and go, oh, okay, well, we'll send more people to those courses. And the, that information got back to the big providers who were offering all these training credits and they would call us up and say, hey, would you brand your course as us and come and give it to these people who want Pearl training? <laughs> With a significant discount to us, right? <laughs> and we're like, yeah, sure, okay. And this op actually opened up opportunities for us to do training abroad as well. We went to New Zealand, we went to Malaysia, we even did some training in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. That was pretty cool. Although, not quite so much for me, because they have strange laws. And after about six years of really crazy long weekends, we figured we had a handle on things. We're like, yeah, we can do this. We were successfully running training courses at a rate where we didn't need to do PHP programming and sysadmin anymore. So we got to give away that part of the business. And this way we could take on bespoke programming that we wanted to do. 
It's like, oh, we want us to rebuild your entire invoicing system because it was written in crazy, horrible Perl, and we're going to make it in more modern Perl? Sweet, we'll totally do that. You want me to do this crazy PHP thing? No, look, this, this other person I know who does that. We've got to be selective. And on top of the general administration, we could choose how much. So we could sort of pick how many hours we wanted. And instead of picking which 60 hours a week we want to work, we got to pick which 30 hours a week we want to work, which was way more sane. We actually did this cost calculation at one point. It's like 80% of our income is coming in from training, and 80% of our time is spent on all this other crap. Can we afford to lose 20% of our income? Yes. So life became so much easier. And we relaxed. Possibly not by the sea, but I liked that picture. Now we did occasionally have crazy schedules. Typically we only had one to two weeks of training in a month, and between the two of us, that meant only one week away. But I did have a week that looked like this, sorry, a month that looked like this. And in fact, there were a couple of years, 2000, so three years, 2011, 2012, 2013, where I spent more nights not in my bed, and in a hotel or something, than I did at home in my own bed. Maybe, maybe only by one or two nights across that year, like but when you calculate it, but I actually really like my bed. I've got this most amazing mattress ever. So when I was doing this month, I started crying an awful lot. <laughs> it's like Perth, Brisbane, Sydney, Canberra, Canberra. Just like, I just want to go home. I can't say I love airports. <laughs> I also can't say I love airplanes. And I'm doing this, this trip to Antarctica in, in a couple of weeks, which is going to be utterly amazing. But there's 25, 24, no, 28 hours of flights between Melbourne and Ushuaia, which is where I'm trying to get to, and they're all in one day. Well, essentially, one and, and then a wait, and a there, and a wait, and a there, and a wait. <laughs> I, I, I'm insane, right? But it's going to be amazing. After the initial startup phase, running a small business was an amazing experience. I know I've said some things that make it maybe sound a little bit less amazing. Seriously, 60 hours a week is crazy. But once we got all that sorted and we had a business and we, people knew who we were and, and people loved us, it was actually pretty awesome. I learned about marketing and accounting and client management and how to do negotiations with clients and with vendors and sometimes they're the same thing. And I'd learned to do technical writing and course development and so much product research and production and delivery. and. I learned a huge range of things. I have got so many skills from running a small business, and it's awesome. And I got to do problem solving. I, you, you know, of course you have to. Like you're, you and, in my, in my case, myself and my uh, Paul, Paul Fenwick, we were the only people doing the business, so one of us had to solve any problem we got. Now, sure, you could pay p money to some other people to do it, like, for example, accountants, and they set up our business structure. I wouldn't want to do that. But we had these wonderful times. Every time we had a problem thrown at us, Excellent, I have to learn a new thing. And I could do much of my work from home. Obviously I couldn't train from home, but the day-to-day -day stuff, absolutely. This gave me a huge amount of flexibility. For example, if it was a sunny day, I could I will do the wash clothes washing today, as opposed to having to leave it to the weekend. We could receive deliveries. I was large in control of which hours I worked and what projects I wanted to work on. I could, and I frequently did, donate time to running conferences. And this could be up to an hour a week, or a week a month, or sometimes a couple of months in the year. Um, OSDC 2004, when we kicked that off, was a tremendous sink. It required pretty much a full-time day from me every week in the last 30 weeks, which as you can guess is actually most of the year. <laughs> and of course, come conference week, it was of course the full week. But it, it can be a tremendous amount of effort, and you should thoroughly thank Ian for doing it this year, because I wouldn't have. But yes, so I got to spend all my time doing conferences if I really wanted to. Of course, I had to still do the work. I got to interact with a huge slice of Australians, Australian IT professionals, not just the wonderful folk who come to conferences, but all those people who work in their desk job and do IT stuff and then go home and never interact with the community. I got to meet those people and teach them Perl. That was pretty cool. I also got a good idea what kind of environments they use. Out of curiosity, does anyone want to guess what percentage of people would, in our courses would expect to program 
in Perl on Windows versus in, uh, on a Unix-like environment? Want to guess? 60-40. 60-40, Windows or? Windows, Windows 60. 80-20 well, Windows? 80-20 Linux and, you know, 20. And here, so, so we've got 60-40 uh, favoring Windows, 80-20 favoring Windows, 20-80 favoring Linux. Anyone else? 100% Unix. 100% <laughs> Unix. I think it's hard. It was actually half. Yeah. On average, 50-50 for Windows like and Unix like. And then we're talking about Perl. That was awesome. I go along to these Perl conferences in the US and I tell them that and they're like, oh, because we don't know any Windows programmers. So I got to find out. I got to learn these people. Now, uh, some examples of, of IT people I got to deal with that don't come to these conferences. A few years ago, a few, um, I worked, we worked with Animal Logic. We taught a whole bunch of their people uh, how to do Perl. Now, they don't use Perl for the actual animation work that they do, but they use it for the sequencing, getting all the things right so they can run it through and take several hours crunching numbers and such. They were incredibly important in making the Lego movie earlier this year. Qantas, so just in case you care, they've now moved to Python. It's very sad. <laughs> Qantas use, used to use Perl, I don't know if they still do, to print their boarding passes. Um, the New South Wales Police Force used to use it for email processing to basically sort out which emails should have, have a higher priority. The Brisbane City Council was our largest local government uh, client and the Attorney General Office mostly based in Canberra, was our largest client ever. Like dollars from them totally eclipse everyone else. Well, not like 50, yeah, you know what I mean. They, it turns out that ASUS and ASIO love Pearl. And user groups across the country were like, hey, when you come to our city, because I, of course, advertised to them to tell them that I was coming, can you give a talk? We will change our regular scheduled meeting to be the date you're here so that you can give us a talk. So this is the Sydney Pearlmongers back probably like 2003 or something when um, Robert Speer, who is the one with his eyes closed on the far right, um, was also visiting town. It was very convenient that we were both in the same place. In fact, there was a, there was a weirdness between uh, when Pearl mailing lists were moved off Major Domo into Mailman. It has turned out that a bunch of them, especially all the Australian and New Zealand ones, failed to restart properly. And so I, not noticing that these, li these mailing lists, which were usually quiet, had gone silent, which is a bit of a difference, I um, pinged everyone I had ever seen an email from on them and said, hey, there's this mailing list that you might not be on. Come and join it and let's restart these mailing lists, and so suddenly it was like, oh, disinterested of the mother of all the Pearl training groups in Australia, sorry, Pearl user groups in Australia, which was a bit weird, but kind of cool at the same time. It won me a White Camel Award. I got to go to conferences because conferencing was for marketing, user groups were marketing. This is how we reached people like yourselves to come along and do our training courses. So I did a bunch throughout the years, and obviously the 2009 one, there was not an exclusive thing, it was just the coolest and prettiest um, LCA logo as far as I was concerned. And that happens to be, I think, the 2011 OzCon because I liked that one. <laughs> when you're working 30 hours a week, it's not that hard to push time around. You're like, oh, I don't want to work on Wednesday. So I'll do a few more hours here and a few more hours there and I'll just take Wednesday off. So if I needed to, my, say my sister who lives in, uh, at the time central Queensland says, hey, can you help me with X? I'll be like, sure, how about this date in the future? I will fly up and help you. And I could do that because I had all this flexibility with time. When you're in charge of your own income stream, where basically how much money you earn depends on how much time you spend on things, you can move that around too. You can say, well, I don't really care if I don't, I won't take that project because I want an easier month. I still had to do the training, but I didn't have to do every project that came my way. So again, I could say, well, I want to move house that month. I'll just not take that project and, you know, refer them to somebody else. And maybe that's future projects I don't earn as well, but you're in control of your money. But there are drawbacks. Absolutely, there are drawbacks. It was so easy and, in fact, possibly an inevitability that a lot of my skills stagnated. I did the same thing every day. I did the same sorts of projects. 
I had no incentive to take on harder, new and exciting projects which would require a whole bunch more hours when there was such a pool of easy projects that just required me to do the same but fun things. And running training is easy and doing administration is easy and I in fact stopped even needing to read the course notes before I gave the course because I had given it so many times. So it became very easy to not even notice that my skills were stagnating. I was writing new training courses, but they weren't typically being run a lot. Turns out employers don't want to send you to advanced courses. Um, so I wasn't necessarily facing new and exciting challenges. I wasn't bored, but I also wasn't learning. And also, I was stressed a lot. I mean, despite this really laid back, I had like all this free time and everything, Despite the fact that I could move my time around the way I wanted, there was this horrible problem that I was ultimately responsible. Or rather, we were ultimately responsible. If we didn't work, we didn't eat. And whilst it never got quite that dire, there was always that thing of, this course didn't go well. Does that mean the training market has changed? This course and the last course didn't go well. Do we need to change our marketing strategy? All the, all the questions, all the marketing, everything was always our responsibility. You couldn't palm it off. You couldn't be sick. If you got sick, the training course still had to run. You couldn't just call up a colleague and drag them in. If a client hadn't paid or the client wasn't happy or the vendor hadn't been paid or the vendor had mischarged you, there was all this confrontation you had to deal with all the time just to make sure that everyone got the things right. So it was stressful and I was always responsible for everything. And we had to juggle everything, of course. Like, there's a no it's nice to know that you can take every Monday off if you really desperately want to. But clients are still going to call on Mondays. It's nice to know that you can do these things, but, but work still goes on. You're never actually off. You're just not actually actively working today. You're just answering the phone every day. We, general enrollment courses always needed a certain amount of work. We couldn't afford to cancel more than one per city, which meant sometimes running a course with only one person in it. So one per city per year. But yeah, sometimes meant running a course with one or two people, which lost money. Um, and we were at the whim of our training facility providers who might just change their minds and not be available that week. It didn't happen too often, but sometimes it was frustrating. As I said, there's no sick leave. Because it was just the two of us, if I was in Perth tra doing training and Paul was in Brisbane doing training and that kind of thing did happen occasionally. If I had a migraine or didn't, my stomach didn't approve of last night's dinner or all those kind of things that can happen, there was no one for me to call and say, hey, I'm really sorry, I can't come in today. Totally couldn't happen. It's like, just go. Do the best training course you can. Every single time. It's hard work. No one else to pick it up and carry on. There's no long service leave, but on the other hand, that, that whole going to conferences, I got to go to the States for six weeks every, um, for several years in a row to do three conferences in a row. So, you know, maybe that's a good trade off with this whole long service leave thing. <laughs> I thought it was. I was pretty happy with that. And the last drawback I want to mention is that working in a home office can be socially isolating. When um, Paul and I were working together, at least we had, you know, each other. But if he was off training somewhere else or working on site with another client, or which we sometimes did for like a month or two at a time, or any of those other things, then you're like, you're there on your own. You, you don't have anyone to bounce ideas off. You don't necessarily have um, anyone to see throughout the whole day. If you don't go out in the evening, um, you might not actually see another person for the whole day. It can be quite socially isolating. So at the end of the last year, I decided to make a huge change. I resigned from Pearl Training Australia, wandered off to Antarctica, had a fabulous time, came back to a new job where I was doing a regular nine to five. Based in the Melbourne CBD. And in many ways, it's bliss. I code and then I go home. Walk in, do my stuff, go home. I'm not on a call. No one's going to call me up at midnight saying, ugh, this is admin problem that really I was going to fall, uh, forward over to Paul anyway. None of that. It's just like, I'm done. And if it breaks, I'll deal with it tomorrow. I, didn't have to, I, I don't have to change invoices or clients. 
I'm not responsible for marketing. I don't do any um, broad planning, although that's a minor frustration as well. I'm responsible for meeting my targets in the time frames I'm given. I'm not responsible for the whole business. I'm not responsible for much at all, just my stuff. If I have a really bad day and just can't be focused on work, no matter what I try, and I, I sit in, in front of my computer and look at Facebook for like a few hours and read my email for a few hours and poke at a few things and desperately want to find motivation, but I can't, if one of those days should happen, I'm still going to get paid. I don't have to always be on. Working in general, working for someone else, blissful. My goodness, blissful. And I have great colleagues who I enjoy working with. I get sick leave, so if I am going to have one of those days, I can just say, look guys, I'm really sorry I can't make it in today. And they take it off my quota of whatever it is, 10 tick days a, week, a year or something. And I don't have to like waste their time. I could just have a day where I stare at the wall all day if that's what it, it, it takes, and I'll be feeling fine tomorrow. Sick leave, it's great, and, and they don't call me up and I don't have to answer phone calls all day, it's great. And most importantly, I'm learning new things regularly. I am frequently, frequently thrown out of my comfort zone. I am frequently told, make this change to do, make the project from doing standard project things to doing this whole new thing over here, 90% of which I don't know anything about. And it's great. I mean, sure, comfort zones are great, but I'm learning. I have to go and read stuff and, 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 and absorb it. And usually I would then write a training course about it, but I don't have to do that bit. But again, there are drawbacks. It's a challenge to go from an extremely flexible lifestyle to what do you mean I have to be at work at nine? And I don't get to leave at five. It's six or when everyone else goes home kind of flexible end time. Actually, I really start at 10. But um, <laughs> all the same, it's like, I can be there at, at, at eight or something, and I'm not at home. I can't just go, well, I've got to get this thing done, but I'll just go put some soup on to heat up so I can have soup while I finish this. So I was like, no, finish the damn thing, and then go get dinner. And I have less, so I have a, a, so much more fixed structure and everything, but I don't like it because I, I would have spread my wings and be a precious snowflake and all those things. <laughs> It's in the city, I have to do this commuting thing. It's kind of crazy, I'm spending an hour going here and an hour going there and, and it's like a bus and a train and a train just to get into work. Although I catch a single tram on the way home. But if I did that because the tram duration is longer and there's a much bigger walk on the way to work, it would take me like an hour and a half to get to work. And Melbourne's not a terrible city. I love Melbourne, but I don't want to buy food in it every day. I'd much rather be able to have access to my kitchen. Now, there is a, a more, more drawbacks. I'm only using a very narrow portion of my skills. I'm learning new things, but I'm doing all this programming and programming only. I'm not doing technical writing or client liaison or business administration or course development or all the fun things that I used to do. I'm not doing any of them. And there's little external incentive for me to be better. I get paid the same amount of money whether I do a superb solution or a good enough solution. And the superb solution takes longer than the good enough solution, so most of the time my boss pressures me to do the good enough solution, even though I can tell that it's only going to be good for like three or four months, whereas if I got given that extra time, it could be good for years. So in fact, there seems to be an external um, pressure to not excel. And I'm getting paid the same amount either. It's kind of easy to be lazy and just go, fine, here's your good enough solution but I don't like it. I'm a perfectionist, I want it right. Actually, I'm fairly pragmatic, and good enough is okay, but my standard for good enough is higher. <laughs> I don't get to control what I'm working on, I don't get to make the decisions. I can be working on something, being given a deadline, I like, totally can meet that, and then have new, so that might be an important thing, and I can have new urgent, but not necessarily important things thrown on my plate. And that's frustrating. And I'm not given a lot of a window into the decision process, so it's hard for me to say, no, this urgent thing you've given me actually doesn't matter. My thing is more important. Because I can't tell what's important, necessarily. I can only tell from my small perception of the whole thing. So I can't see the big picture as easily as I'd like. 
we're not big on conferences. This, my, my, my business is not a community, as an open source community focused business. I'm here on my own time, on leave, paying my own way, all of those kind of things, because it's just not something my business is interested in. And I kind of like being part of the community and having a business that's all about the community. And I discovered that difficult colleagues are much harder to deal with than difficult clients, because you can fire difficult clients. Like, I'm really sorry, we can't continue working with you, but I found you this replacement. Go and bother them. You don't put that that way. <laughs> so in conclusion, my own business had a whole bunch of pros. Lots of awesome things that I could do. And it had a bunch of cons. It was hard work, it was stressful. It was sometimes isolating. Full-time employment also has a lot of pros. Including, actually, I didn't mention this one, but a higher salary. That's pretty sweet. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, we could have paid ourselves more. It, for tax reasons, it was better not to. So, of course, now I have to pay more taxes, which is not such a bad thing. And, yeah, but it has a bunch of cons as well. And I'm not going to tell you which one you should do. But I will tell you that um, running your own business is a hell of a ride. Okay, thank you. Yes. Do you think it would have made your last 12 years or whatever a little bit less stressful if it hadn't been just you two, but maybe a company of four or five? <laughs> okay, so do I think that my business and all of that would be less stressful if it had been not just the two of us, but four or five people, maybe a few more? Yeah. Yep. We actually tried that. We uh, employed a, a, at different times a few ex uh, extra people to help us out. And it was actually far more stressful because there's this problem where going from two people to three people, um, a 50% increase in the number of people you have basically means at least one of those two people needs to spend almost full time with the third person, a bunch of time bringing them up to speed. And so you can't actually take on extra workers when you're at, say, 100% capacity because you don't have that extra time. And so then you take on an extra person maybe when you're at 60% capacity, that seems sane. And then you're like, because your income's going like this, you're kind of like, I really hope I can, I really hope I get enough money. I really hope that I can pay this person's salary on a consistent basis. And I hope not, we don't have too many training courses that fail. And yeah, no, we, we did try it a few times. And essentially, we just didn't feel we had the, the time, the energy, and the sufficiently regular income to Brave it out. So it, it did not work. There were other reasons it didn't work, but that was a large part of it. Yes? Uh, well, you said you had someone that you were paying for. Why didn't you uh, try with someone to join you as, uh, on equal basis? OK, so that was question was, why, was I pay why were we paying a salary rather than inviting someone else in to work on an equal basis? Um, I don't know if you've ever done consulting. This is not about you because I don't know much about your history. But there's this wonderful thing where clients say to you, I've got this great idea. How about you do all this work for free and then we'll go 50-50 or 20-80 or something on, on the profit at the end. And most people who've done consulting are like, no, no, I just want to get paid. And pretty much that seems to be what most of the job market's like as well. They're like, no, you don't know if you're going to be able to pay me 40 grand in a year. I'm not really excited by that. I'm going to work at this job over here that's much safer. So you couldn't find anyone? We actually thought about it and just didn't even try. I'm not saying that they wouldn't exist, but our, our estimations on, on the industry at large suggested that it was not worth the effort. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much.